in like a, a death match or something, or like, I'll just uh, like do vac stuff for like you know 10, 10, 15 minutes. Okay, awesome, awesome. Now, obviously, this is not going, man. Okay, I'm sorry. Blizzard is fucking spammy as hell. Okay, um, so obviously this is not going to be an AIM coaching session. We're going to be looking at uh, gameplay today. And uh, since we didn't really have time to talk about uh, this sort of stuff in the AIM coaching session, the way that these sessions are generally structured... Or actually, first of all, um, the disclaimers here are exactly the same as in uh, the AIM coaching session. So you don't have to worry about like privacy or anything. Everything here stays private. Um, you should also definitely take notes here. Uh, again, you are going to get a, a, a written summary on Metafile, but it's still nice to have some self-written notes, you know, in case I miss something. And uh, lastly, uh, your 30-day coaching pass that you got with the M coaching session obviously gets refreshed back to 30 days. So it's 30 days starting from now. Okay? Gotcha. Okay, now the way that this session is structured is before we even take a look at any gameplay, uh, we're gonna do a little bit of talking so I can, you know, know a little bit about where you are, what goals you have, and outside of, um, you know, aiming related topics, kind of how you approach improvement in in general. So I guess what made you say, or what, what made you go get uh, an Overwatch session after the aim coaching session? Uh, well, I figured, um... Like, everything ties together, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. What I was, like, tunnel visioning on is, like, well, I want to learn, you know, I want to get in there and actually be able to, you know, hit sleeps, hit nades, or just hit shots on Baptiste uh, mm -hmm. uh, before, you know, I could really... Once I have... Basically, my mindset was once I can actually aim a little bit, uh, I can start learning the game and where to place myself, position, um, and just get more familiar about where, I, where and why I should be playing the way I am. Okay, so you had the aim coaching session, now you're pretty set on aim, you know what to do. Now you want to look at kind of the game sense, decision making aspects of the game, all that. Yes. Okay, okay, perfect. So, in you, you said that, you know, you're chilling in plat um, right now. Can you maybe, what's your take on why you're plat and, 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 and what's been... You know, besides aim, what's been keeping you from improving as a player? Uh, one thing I will say is timing, as like especially resource management. Uh, mm -hmm. I find myself this dawn nades, or I mainly play uh Anna and Baptiste. Uh, so that's and yeah, but uh, just using resources like you know too early or uh, just not placing them well enough and not like knowing when. I should really throw, like, I don't know how to really explain it, but just not really knowing, uh, you know, good timings and uh, openings and putting myself in a good position to, you know, uh, throw, like, an immortality or a nade. Uh, I know that's keeping me back. Uh, not really making much of a impact on the game, you know? Okay, okay. So you basically want to figure out how you can make it, how you can kind of gain more agency over the outcome of the game as a support yes yeah okay make a diff make it yes <laughs> okay no very good so um what what have been your efforts so far to try and alleviate that so you mentioned that you've been having issues you know knowing how to time your abilities how to position yourself if coaching didn't exist right if you didn't have this session what would be your approach actively actively like watching i would go back um and watch my vods and see and kind of think about like slow down uh, a frame and kind of think about the options uh you know before i go into a team fight and kind of just actively think about when to throw uh certain abilities mm -hmm. uh i do feel like i've been getting better at it uh, now that i'm actively thinking about it i'll uh you know just uh Probably just like re uh, rewatching VODs and uh, actively thinking about uh, when and when not to, you know, use uh, resources. Okay, so how often do you review those VODs? Uh, I would say if I don't review them after I'm done playing, probably before I play the next session. So you review once for every single session? Uh. No, sometimes I'll review like, 
sometimes I'll I'll just warm up and play normally, mm -hmm. and then uh, like the next day I'll come back and kind of watch watch how how that happened. Okay, I mean, so I might watch one one to three uh, games per VOD review. One to three games. Yes. Well, one 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 to three vods. Yeah. Okay. And how much per week do you have these VOD review sessions where you look at one to three vods? Is that like um, a daily thing? Every other day, two to three probably, times a week. Maybe maybe once or twice a week. Okay. So it's um. Can you maybe explain in in your own words what the purpose is behind the VOD review? Uh, to review your gameplay. Uh. And kind of see how you can change things. Yes. But we need to kind of understand the process behind it a little bit. To see why your current approach isn't as optimal as it as it as it could be. So first of all, you implied that you try to review before you play the game. But if I understood correctly, there are also situations where you play some games, right? And then at the end of your uh, gaming session, you take a look at your your replays. First of all, if that's something you do, you want to avoid doing that. The main point behind a VOD review is to set yourself goals and things you want to try out, right, once you actually go in-game. So an, an easier way to understand this is if you think about learning a different game. So if uh, if you look at a very complex game, if you look at Civilization, for example, that's like a very complex game, right? And you're you're always learning new stuff. And at least for me, or for a lot of people who, who want to learn very complex games, um, you know, maybe we, we watch a video on it. And then in that video, we see that the person uses a specific strategy, you know, he rushes a certain technology or unit or something, right? And then that gives us something specific that we can then try out the next time we play the game, you know, maybe we notice that he plays a lot more aggressive. So next time we play a round of Civ, we're going to try and play more aggressive and kind of see how that goes. So the purpose behind a VOD review is that you have something very specific to focus on for the game, for the, you know, play session that you're about to have. And Another reason, so first of all, we want to review before our games so we have a goal. And the second is an, an inherent problem with reviewing games after we play them. Because having just played a game colors our perception. So if maybe you have a very, very frustrating loss and then, you know, you try to review it immediately afterwards, it can be very, very difficult to kind of look past your, your emotions and your assumptions and kind of have an objective look at the game. And it's better to just, you know, take the evening off, wait until the next day, kind of sleep over the games and then look at the game with, you know, refreshed eyes. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so review before we play. And now it's, uh, as I mentioned, the main purpose is that we want to review not just to kind of measure our progress, but also to kind of find new things that we can try, you know, play more aggressive, flank more, focus different targets, use our abilities in different ways, ult earlier, right? Like stuff we want to try out. But that only works if we do that, sorry, if we do that before each session or each, each play session. So... Uh, right now, you do reviews not super frequently, you know, like once or twice a week. But the reviews are very; it can be very in depth. You say that sometimes you review up to tr three replay codes, right? So it's important uh, to understand that VOD reviews uh, shouldn't be particularly long, right? They should be around fifteen minutes, maybe, because all you're doing is you just choose one particular replay code, right? And you just watch through it, right? And you don't have to pause and ponder and think too much about it because we're not trying, uh, we're not trying to analyze the games, right? When we analyze the game, like you know, when I have a session with you, I analyze your game, so I really try to pick it apart, look at sections, pause, rewind, all of that stuff. When you vod review, you just review it, you just rewatch it basically. So a twenty-minute game 
shouldn't take more than 15 minutes to review because obviously you can skip over hero select and you know whenever you die you can skip to when you're actually back in action right um but in in return because the reviews are short you know maybe 15 minutes we want to try to implement them into our into like a daily routine we want to do them before every single play session does all of that make sense yeah do you have any questions uh no not so far okay so uh now that uh, that's out of the way we're going to take a look at your gameplay soon and then by looking at you know how I review the gameplay or at how I analyze your gameplay, you can kind of maybe ask questions about, you know, why I spot certain things or, you know, why I'm focusing on certain things. And VOD reviewing is a skill, right? I've been doing this for six years. Uh, so I wasn't very good at it at the start, right? Um, so when you start to VOD review kind of regularly on a daily basis, you're not always going to find something. Sometimes you're going to review a game and you're just going to say, okay, I have no idea what I was supposed to do better there. But that's okay because you're going to do it every single day and each time you start to see more and more patterns and you get better at it. So think of VOD reviewing not as kind of a supplement to playing the game. Think of it as an an own individual skill that you need to kind of grow and 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 uh you know improve at now okay the um uh the last thing that we'll quickly talk about and then we can look at gameplay is kind of motivations because that's something that we also didn't really get into that much during the aim coaching session um obviously you're plat right now can you but can you maybe talk a little bit about your ambitions with the game uh like my overall goal like my yeah, why? Yeah, exactly. Like why? Because obviously, right? Like there's there's no point talking around it. You getting dedicated coaching, right? And not just coaching for like five bucks on some random website, but like, you know, getting coaching from like an esports coach like me, right? That already puts you into the small subset of players who are really, really serious about improving. Right. So, what's that motivation behind improving? What ambition are you chasing after? It brings me satisfaction knowing that uh, that I'm not this. Like, it, it it brings me satisfaction knowing that I'm getting like actively getting better at something. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just like a very and then uh, okay, gaming is my hobby, and if I I would like to be you know good at that hobby, obviously mm -hmm. it brings me enjoyment. Uh, to be, you know, good at something. So, mm -hmm. uh, just trying to improve on on. Uh, if I I feel that I would have a higher higher uh, quality like higher quality gaming experience if I'm actually better at a game that I'm playing. You know, so mm -hmm. I want to get better. Uh, that's my motivation. Just because I also love Overwatch, so I want to be good at it. So yeah. Okay. Uh, so how do you define good? Uh, what would it mean for you? You know, at which point would you say I'm good at Overwatch? Probably mid or high masters. Mid high masters. Okay, okay. And then obviously, I'm assuming that after you reach mid to high masters, you'd still try to go even higher. But that would be kind yes. of the first big milestone for you. Yeah, where I'm just like, okay, I'm actually kind of decent at this game, you know? Okay, so. okay, okay. Now, that's a pretty good, pretty good goal to have. I mean, once you reach mid to high masters, you already belong to, like, the top few percent of the player base. And then once you get into GM, that's, like, the top one percent of the player base. And one thing you have to keep in mind is that um, uh, with Overwatch 2 right getting higher ranks is much more difficult than it was in overwatch one because there is a significantly larger amount of players that you need to supersede so for example if you know top 500 nowadays right is a lot more like if that's something that you maybe want to hit one day top 500 nowadays is much more exclusive than it was back then because back then in overwatch one i mean i don't want to shit on the game but how many players did we have like two or three million you know and now that number has shot up to over 30 million so all of a sudden there's a lot of players who also want to improve that you're you're competing against so mid to high masters is 100 percent like a respectable rating. So I think that's a good first goal to have. Now, 
enough chit chat. Unless you have any questions or any topics you want to talk about in specific, uh, we can take a look at some uh, gameplay. If you have a, a replay code for me. Uh, yeah. Yes, I do. All right, send it over. By the way, during this session, if I ever go quiet for a second, it's because I'm also taking notes on the side for the written summary. So just don't okay. be, you know, don't think I randomly disconnect. <laughs> All right, there we go. Um, let me quickly load that in. Um, ah, yes, Circuit Royale always makes me happy. It's a very good map. The screen share should be up. Okay, yeah, it is. Okay, so what's the hero distribution during this game? I believe I played Ana. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure if I played anybody else. Okay. Okay. No, it's just good to know because this, then we so, can. So this is this is from a I think a couple days ago. Um, I, I wanted to take a look at this game in in specific because Circuit Royale uh, is like a hard map for me, mm -hmm. especially on defense. Uh, it's kind of I, I kind of don't know uh, like where to position not like not necessarily position but like this rotating in general just like when to do it uh at the right time or just like looking for aggressive nades uh it's kind of difficult it's kind of mm -hmm. just hard to think about that and like try to heal the team and get some shots off and you know mm -hmm. what i mean mm -hmm. um okay. so i'm trying to get better at that just be more of an active proactive uh like support player okay so before we go into into the game plan any of that can you maybe just uh, maybe we'll just do a little bit of theory first so we have a baseline can you try to define you know good ana gameplay like give me uh, an ana crash course ana 101 okay uh so i would say you want to be looking for high ground uh want to look for aggressive nades uh very very like if if you see an enemy out of position you kind of want to you kind of want to like set yourself up to be able to sleep, uh, sleep, uh, at a sleep enemies when they are like kind of out of position, uh, when you, they can kind of be punished or you can punish them yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, you want to be like on, on high ground, kind of taking shots and healing and looking for damage. Uh, you want to be rotating a lot, not a lot, but like you want to basically be like behind your tank, uh, and just shooting at them from different angles, just applying pressure with nades, and just mainly, you know, using high ground and rotating around high ground, using natural cover, uh, quick scoping a lot, uh, yeah, and just looking at your nano targets and uh, just kind of staying away from your threats. Okay, so a, a very good start. It kind of fell apart towards the end. I think you, you, you <laughs> there was no time limit, right? So. <laughs> Okay, so so let's go over the the last like rushed points uh, real quick. You said looking at your nano targets. What does that mean? Okay, well I meant like looking at the at like looking at your composition to see who makes sense to nano here. Okay, and how you decide? How do you decide? You know who would who make sense nano? to nano? Yeah, like at your team. Probably in, in your team. Most, probably. Who, whatever would get the most value, like probably Hog or uh, probably Bob. This is probably honestly, this is not a good Ana comp, in my opinion. Well, what would be a good Ana comp? Um, uh, probably like a Genji instead of the May, or or literally anything else. Uh, I don't know. I, I just feel like you can't really nano. You can nano Bob, but like it's kind of hard to get a good Bob placement to be able to nano it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Hog obviously is a good nano target. Um, you said Hog ob obviously. Or be be yeah, very I feel like, very I feel like careful. Hog is a great nano target. Okay, okay. Opinion. Just be careful about using the word obviously because obviously. very often people say obviously and then it feels really bad when I have to tell them they're wrong, you know? <laughs> so just yeah. say, you know, okay, okay. So, um 
So there were a few things that where 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 we need a little bit of a per perspective shift. Okay, so let's let's start with the nano boost. You said that you would have preferred a Genji here, for example. I'm assuming because you want to combo with with nano yeah. Blade, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so that's a very um, nice thought, right? But um, why is nano blade terrible? Why uh, is nano blade ninety nine percent of the time? A throw. There's two reasons. Probably because it gets shut down easy. Um, if the team plays right, like, well, I'm actually not entirely sure because mm -hmm. honestly, in my plat games, most of the time, most of the time, Nano Blade kind of like, just kills the entire team. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But okay. but I feel like it could easily get Suzu'd, and then he can get turned on. Uh, the healers could really be taking care of each other. Uh, it, I, I think it really just depends on the situation. So I can't. I, I really don't know. Uh, like overall, why it would be terrible? Considered terrible. Okay. Um. So let's. Okay. So there's two aspects to it, right? The first aspect that you're not considering. So you said that oh, it's good because whenever I use it, you know, we just kill the entire enemy team. But the way you have to think about this is that is that really something. Is that really good? Like, if you use ultimates, if you use two ultimates, and you kill the entire enemy team, all five people, right? Is that really good? What would a high-level player think? Uh, probably the less ultimates, the better. Right, you know? He would say, oh, wow, like, we really fucked them? But was that really necessary? You know? Yeah, like if if yeah, if if, if if we killed five of them, like did we really need two ultimates? And that's kind of the issue. So ult economy is very very important because if you use too many ultimates in a team fight, you're not gaining wins, you're borrowing them. Imagine that you your team used five ultimates. Everyone used their ultimate, right? And you one shot the enemy team. They literally die in like two seconds. All of them. It's a team kill. You know, they're just going to regroup. Right. And then what? 15 seconds later, they're going to be back. And then they use one ultimate and they kill you because you don't have any ultimates of your own. Right? And then you regroup and they use another ult. And then you regroup and they use another ult. And so on and so on until eventually you guys get ultimates again and you can regroup. So you win one fight, but if you over ult, you're losing subsequent fights in return. Does that make sense? I'm sorry, I'm assuming you said yes, but your mic didn't pick it up? Oh, sorry, yes. Okay, yes. all good, all good, all good. So that's the first problem. It's just a lot of ultimates. Using two ultimates to win a team fight can be a little bit overkill. And now we need to take a look at your Genji, right? So um, there's only two possible, uh, two possible situations here. Either your Genji is good <clears throat> or your Genji is bad, right? Obviously, a little bit of a simplification, you know, there's Genjis in between. But he's either good or bad. If you have a good Genji, does he really need the nano boost? Like, let's say you have, like, a master smurf Genji in your team. And he uses Blade. Does he really need nano to get, you know, one or two kills and win the fight with Blade? Probably not. Especially since the Genji is usually in control of when he blades, right? When you guys use Nano Blade, it's not like you Nano him and then he blades. Usually he decides when to blade and then you Nano, right? So he thinks it's a good blade opportunity, right? Or he's bad, in which case, do you really want to pump your Nano Boost in him? Probably not, because what's worse than winning a team fight using too many ultimates? Losing a team fight using too many ultimates, right? Um, so there's just a lot of risks attached. Now, once we start to look at high elo, things are a little bit differently, because in high elo, you're going to play with very good Genji players, right? But you're also going to play against very, very strong opponents, which means that even though your Genji is very, very good, because the enemy team is also good, he needs the nano in order to actually get value. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. 
So what's a more maybe consistent, what's a safer way of using our nano that ensures that we always get value out of it? I would say probably nanoing the front line. When? That doesn't uh, that doesn't guarantee us value yet. Right? If you just randomly yeah. nano boost the Rotog, what happens if you disconnect? Obviously a little bit of a dramatic example, right? But yeah, there's no yeah. inherent value yet. So how can we guarantee that when we press Q, even if he disconnects, we got value? Probably nano in the bob. Right? There, um, don't don't focus too much on the specific game. I mean, there's the same problem with Bob. But what happens if the Bob just gets slapped or she fucks up her Bob and it ends up in a really dumb location where it doesn't do anything, right? So there's still no guarantee. What is the only way to 100% guarantee value? Uh, I don't know. If you heal someone with it. Yeah. Imagine you're... Yeah, I, was gonna, I was gonna say saving someone's life with it. Yes, exactly. Saving someone's life with it, right? Because at that, at, at that point, right? Imagine that you're a Rotog, he goes in, right? And he gets absolutely shit on. He takes a huge load of damage and he's about to die, right? The moment you use Nano Boost on him, you completely screw over the enemy team because they've invested all of those cooldowns and all of those resources trying to take the Rotog down and then you press one button and you undo all of that work. And after that, even if the Rotog doesn't do anything, even if the Rotog just backs out and goes AFK, your Nano will still have generated value. And if he's insane, right, he can get value on top of that. Maybe you use your nano to save him, already giving you guaranteed value, and then he uses his ultimate afterwards and kills three people. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. It's like gambling with someone else's money. If you lose, <laughs> you don't really lose anything. If you win, nice, you know, we will take the cherry on top. Does all of that... Okay help you understand how we need to think about nano boost if we want to consistently get results it's, as Anna. Yeah. Right? Uh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um me I thought that the best way to do it is to just try but you the best way to do it is to try to combo something. Mm -hmm. Uh and that like you just said that's sometimes it's over most of the time it's over like not really necessary. Mm -hmm. And you're right cuz it really doesn't it really just kind of steamrolls and then like you said when when they go for the group uh, we're kind of like down a, a support ult you know uh, yes. so yes uh, and then saving someone's life with it like that does get immense value because it, it just prolongs the fight as well um, so exactly imagine you, you like you see the enemy tank is about to die they're super low HP you think you get a free kill here and then all of a sudden instead of a 1 HP tank there's a full HP nano boosted Zarya in front of you. That turns the the tide of the fight very, very quickly. Okay? Okay. One thing I will say is that sometimes sure. like everything's happening super fast. So like mm -hmm. just knowing when to press that button is kinda sometimes it's difficult for me. Sometimes I'll just hold it and knowing that I'm like, damn, I don't wanna use it and then like I hope it gets value and then I just overthink it and just don't do it sometimes. So that's a bad habit I have to... I noticed about myself that I have to fix. Everything is difficult when you start out. That's exactly why we are... Like, ultimately, that's what improving is, right? It's understanding something so we know, you know, that, that we do something wrong. And then it's going to be difficult at first to not repeat that mistake, but with practice, it gets easier and easier and easier, you know? To a high-level player, it's completely second nature. Oh, my high-energy Zarya is about to die. I'm going to nano her to save her, right? But in order to build that intuition, that situational awareness, that, you know, just it being second nature took a lot of time, took a lot of practice. So don't worry too much about it. It's going to get easier. Now we 
talked about Nano Boost, right? Um, another thing is you mentioned that like Genji is a, is a, you would have preferred a Genji here instead of Mei. Um, it's actually, in my opinion, it's actually the exact opposite. I think Mei is much much nicer here for Ana, because Genji can be very very difficult to heal because he always dives in, right? And he's very hard to hit. Whereas with Mei, it's much easier to keep her alive. And you also have really, really good synergy with her, right? For example, if uh, she uses her ultimate, you can throw in a huge nade, right? Or if she, if you sleep someone, she can wall the slept target off from the enemy healers. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Okay. Now, another thing you mentioned, and I'm sorry you're you're just looking at a paused screen all this time. We're going oh, to yeah. look over the gameplay in a second. We just need to cover some theory. Um, another thing you mentioned is uh, you want to try and quick scope a lot, uh, which I found very interesting. Can you maybe elaborate on why you want to quick scope a lot? Uh, well, when you're quick scoping, uh, it's it's a lot easier to see what's really going on because you're not spending a lot of time zoomed in. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you'd move a lot slower when you're just sitting there hard scoping. You're an easy target sitting there. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, yeah, I would say just like visibility, visibility, and uh, like just not being like an easy target all the time, just mm -hmm. by sitting there hard scoping. Yes. If you can go for a quick scope, you might as well just go for the quick scope. Mm -hmm. So those are the pros, but what's the con? Of heart of quick scoping. Yes. What's the Slow, big yeah, big your, butt? I would say your DPS is like a lot slower. It's very very slow, right? Yeah. So quick scoping, it's actually kind of the opposite. Quick scoping is a, is is kind of a niche tech that you want to do sometimes. Yes, of course, but yeah, only uh, when necessary. Yeah. Yes, yes. I and I learned that too. I learned that I thought that quick scoping was the only thing you had to do and I quickly learned that sometimes it really doesn't matter. Sometimes if it's actually easier and you're like safe, uh you might as well just land easier hard scope. Exactly. Uh exactly. Sometimes you want a quick scope. Sometimes exactly. you just want to un you know, un un uh, unscope. Exactly. So. Quick scoping is really nice when you want to do like a little fade away shot, you know, maybe you're disengaging and you just want to poke some damage into the enemy team. Um, maybe you want to. Maybe your Genji dives in. He's very hard to hit, and you just want to quickly top him off with a quick scope, right? Ideally, you only want to quick scope when you only plan on landing one shot, right? Maybe okay. maybe an enemy is low HP, and you know that one shot is going to kill them, or maybe one of your teammates has taken damage, but not a lot of damage, just a little bit of damage that you know that one quick scope is going to be enough. But when you're healing your tank, for example, you either hard scope or no scope. When you're trying to poke enemies, right, you usually want to land multiple shots back to back on them to really apply uh, apply pressure. Quick scoping doesn't allow you to do that. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. Now uh, you said sleep enemies when they are out of position. That's one hundred percent correct. Uh, you really want to use your sleep to kind of catch enemies off guard. One mistake that a lot of people make is they kind of look for Kobe sleeps, so they just throw the sleep dart halfway across the map and then they land it on like a Widowmaker all the way in the back and they're they're like they get super giddy like oh holy shit I'm so good I'm ML7 uh, and they try to wake her and get dinked you know I mean <laughs> that and it's like what happens more often is a Genji jumps them and they die because they don't have sleep right so with sleep dart you really want to look at enemies that you can punish with it Right. For example, if you look at the enemy team comp right now, I know one person hasn't picked yet, but what's like one very obvious or not obvious? Again, see now I use the word obvious, right? What's uh what's like a, a major opportunity when you look at the enemy team for your sleep dart that you want to look out for? Uh, probably Kiri with her cleanse, Suzu. How do you mean? Wait, you said you said so wait hold on can you ask that question one more time so when you look at the enemy team right i mentioned that you don't really want to go for kobe sleeps just randomly spamming them because you might find yourself in a situation where you really want to sleep someone but you don't have it available right so you don't just want to spam it on cooldown when you look at the enemy team what is one particular situation that you really want to have a sleep dart ready for uh, probably when the Sig pushes into our Roadhog. Not um, just when he pushes? 
Mm. When he uses his ultimate. Oh, yes. Right? Yes. Your sleep can yeah. single... Imagine you going for a random sleep to try and sleep the sojourn in the back. And then one second later, the enemy Sigma ults. And then your team flames you. They're like, what the fuck? Why didn't you sleep him? Right? So you want yeah. to be careful about not wasting it. Sometimes just having your sleep available applies a lot of pressure and kind of prevents the enemy team from playing how they want to. Right? Um, okay. Aggressive nades. That's very good. That's 100% correct. And uh, look for high ground, you said. Um, can you maybe elaborate a little bit on positioning with Ana? Uh, honestly, I would say high ground is good for Ana because you can, obviously you're a sniper character, you can kind of see more. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's easier to hit your nades from an, like, a arcing, like an arcing perspective. This geometry is better on high ground, I would say. It's uh, mm -hmm. and then the, when people are, are looking at you, you have a kind of a weird hitbox, so you can you just do really well on high ground because your hitbox is really weird. You can kind of just crouch and and uh, throw nades and just be really annoying on on high mm -hmm. ground. Mm -hmm. But what's a potential downside of high ground sometimes? Uh, I. A potential downside of high ground. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not entirely sure. Well, what happens if you're on high ground, right? So if we if we look at the gameplay here, you're on high ground, right? But let's say the rest of your team is down here. What's a potential downside of you being up here? Well, uh, I would put my. I would be. I would be putting myself in line of sight to kind of try to be with the team and once I notice that they're uh, that once I notice I'm out of position I have to kind of like make myself uh, like well I, I don't know because I could could not just like break the barrier down to the bottom right and just like rotate out although I'm putting myself in line of sight for a few seconds you can but it takes time right yeah one major downside of going on high ground as Ana is that you're split from your team right Yes. If a Genji, for example, dives you or a Tracer dives you, your supports might not be able to heal you immediately. If you stand down here, you know, Lucio can amp, heal, and you're going to be fine. But if you stand up here, you know, amp heal doesn't go through walls, right? Okay. So right. by the time you drop down to get healed, maybe you're already dead. And just being next to your team, right, is a big, big deterrent. So the enemy Genji or the enemy Tracer, they might not even go for you because they right. see that you're in the middle of your team and if they get too close, they're going to get one shot. Does all of that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Are you ready to look at the gameplay or do you have any questions about anything we've talked about so far? Uh, well, uh, well, avoiding... Obviously, you should avoid being split from your team, but mm -hmm. but doesn't that just... Wouldn't uh, the correct play here be... Uh, wouldn't the correct play uh, be like when they are coming around the corner and my team is backing up, just rotate, rotate out, and just uh, be like w behind the choke real quick, like before the the whoever is like, say they have a Genji before they mm -hmm. even be, before they're even able to like single me out and just try to like dive on me because they see mm -hmm. that I'm split, like beforehand, just just rotate with the team like when they're getting pushed back. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yes. Okay. Right. It's, it's 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 just knowing when to you know do that exactly uh, exactly. So that's yeah. exactly right. Okay. You don't want to think of high ground as this holy grail that's like never wrong. You want to think of the pros of high grounds, but uh, high ground. But you also always want to be aware that you might potentially be split from your team, and the potential consequences of that. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at some uh, gameplay. Enough. Uh, enough small talk. Okay. Now, obviously, right, um, one last thing regarding high ground. When your team is with you on high ground, that changes things. Because then you can have all the benefits of high ground without being split. Okay? Gotcha. So, for example, if the Ash was with you up here, that would be a big deterrent for a Genji diving you because all of a sudden he's diving two people instead of one. Okay. 
So already looking at the start of the round, right? This is why we did all of that theory because we can now look at this, right? Um, <laughs> already, right? You start off with quick scoping on the ash, which isn't fundamentally wrong. But what do we want to do here? Uh, probably look for a big nade uh, while they're walking up. Um, it's a little bit early for nade. Right, the enemies are very far away, so your chances of hitting a nade are pretty low. But applying pressure. Oh, right? yeah, looking for damage. Looking right, for looking, damage. looking for damage. Right, something small like scoping in here and just a little bit of damage on this soldier and a little bit of damage on this, on this, on on this sigma. Right, you're Lucio here. He got kind of one shot. There isn't really that much. Like, I mean, there's nothing you could have done for him. Right. But yeah. if you apply pressure, right, if you start dealing damage to the enemy team early, the more pressure they're under, the less pressure they can apply. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and then I do have a question about this comp. Like, shouldn't we be, like, on... Shouldn't we be, like, where I am? Well, um, I guess not. I'll give you a very because... unsatisfying answer. Does that matter? What no, your team should no. do? I, I don't think it really matters. Uh, I think what I should focus on is what I'm doing. <laughs> yes, exactly. You can't control them. So you're already thinking like a few steps ahead when you start playing in like a team and everyone knows each other. When you're in solo queue, you just look at what your team does. You trust their decision making, right? Like that Lucio, right? Like to you, it looks like he just kind of fed, you know? But like maybe from his perspective, he was trying to peek here. Look, he's shooting to try and apply pressure, right? Now, the reason why he died here is because his movement is dog shit, right? Like ideally in Overwatch, you want to strafe, but he just runs into the enemy team in a straight line, which makes him very easy to hit, right? So right. he's a shit player who should buy coaching, you know? Okay, jokes aside, but kind of understanding why your teammates want to do certain things and then adapting our play style around it as best as we can right gotcha so right here this sleep dart was a good sleep dart or the attempt was good because the enemy team got a pick so what will they most likely want to do they want to try and push in so using your sleep dart here to try and shut down their push would be very nice right as a little tip with your sleep dart uh try to aim your sleep dart at corners right so right here you like tried to aim it a little bit hard you know you want to like hit someone over here literally just aim it at like the edge of the payload for example or the edge of the staircase or the edge of this corner right because uh, especially as you start getting to to higher levels uh, people are going to do something called peak shooting right so for example the enemy torb he's going to do this Right. Well, I mean, I guess he would do it around the payload here, right? He would kind of like chill here, shoot, back, shoot, back, shoot, right? Kind of back and forth. So just whenever you go for kind of a blind sleep dart like that, just aim it at a corner because that maximizes your chances of landing the sleep dart. Okay. Uh, sure. But yeah, the sleep was nice, the nade was nice, but you can also kind of see the problems with this position, right? When you're split from your team, it also means that you're very far away, so projectiles are harder to hit, right? Right. The sleep dart would be much easier to hit from down here. The nade would be much easier to land from down here, but from up here, very far away. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And is it because, is it because, well, they're, well, obviously because they're far away, but mm -hmm. um, I also would rather have played up here because, like, well, they're looking at my team, and then I can kind of just be annoying on high ground. Although I'm not doing a very good job. See, that, that's, that's what <laughs> I, I mean, right? I... You can be annoying, but because you're so yeah. far away, you're not being annoying. Right, okay. Right? Like, arguably, yeah. being down here and actually landing your abilities because you're not on the other edge of the world would be way more annoying for them. Right? Gotcha. But your Lucio died, so he can come back from spawn very quickly. So ideally, you guys want to just kind of chill. It's also very depressing that you guys actually lost someone, even though, like, one of them is literally AFK, right? Um, but yeah, right here, this is an example of the problems with high ground. So right now, you're on high ground, and you can't see any of your teammates, right? You can't heal them, 
So you need yeah. to actually like, look, you're not doing anything. You're here. Okay. I, I was like, okay, I'll, how right. do I get value? How do I get right. value? <laughs> and then you need to drop down. But look, by the time you look back on your team, look at the shit show. Everyone's low HP. Yeah. You've fallen behind, right? You need yeah. to think of healing. Healing is is kind of a tug of war, right? There's only two people healing, but there is five enemies dealing damage, or in this case, four, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. So if you just, in this tug of war, if you just let go of the rope for even one second, this is what happens. You know, you start to fall behind on your builds, so to say, right? <clears throat> so you try to heal your team up, right? In this situation, don't unscope. You're uh, out of line of sight of the enemy team. Just stay scoped. Don't waste time going in and out of scope. So you can uh, keep, like, right here, for example, if you would have just stayed in the scope all this time instead of wasting time going in and out of scope, no one needed to die here. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I find myself doing that a lot. Mm -hmm. So uh, right here, the nade, again, I mean, that's kind of an aim thing, you know? Obviously, that's something yeah. that... Uh, that you know, the stuff we discussed in the aim coaching session can't help you with because it's a projectile. You know, you need to kind of just learn that through experience. But right here, if you would have played differently, if you would have landed that sleep dart and the nade earlier, you would have applied a lot more pressure on the enemy team that would have prevented them from pushing in. If you just stayed hard scope, if you dropped from high ground sooner, you could have uh, done a lot more healing on your team, which means they wouldn't have died, right? And the Lucia is back by now, so if you would have played this differently, May and Ash could still be alive. And then you could have a very, very good defense here. But instead, now you're at a numbers disadvantage, your team needs to get out, and you risk trickling. Right? And now this is also very, very curious. So you're healing your Rotok here. Right? And clearly, yeah. he needs a lot of healing, because why else would you try to throw a nade at him? Right? Right. The reason you threw a nade at him is because he needs a lot of healing. So then yeah. why would you run away? Well... Okay, I, I, I can kind of see what I was thinking here. Mm -hmm. uh, mainly, the main thing is trying not to take any, like... not Trying not to get, like, one shot or railed by the uh, Sojourn... Mm -hmm. Or uh, so I was like, well, and then it kind of looks, it kind of looks like a losing fight. I'm not gonna lie. Like even if I was sitting there like spamming him, hit the whole, like five people are shooting at him. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't think that uh that me staying there, I, although it would have been great for all charge. I don't think me staying there would have been great for my survivability. Right, but that's the thing. You do it for the ult charge. Okay. Yeah. Right? You still had three shots left. I mean, obviously, again, with, with the nade, you know, this is kind of obvious. Uh, aim the nade above people's heads, right? Yes. You can't just, like, yeah. hold left click on an enemy and then randomly press E. You need to move your crosshair. But th th those are three extra shots you could have thrown into the Roadhog, right? And here you kind of just ditch your team, you know? Like, look how long your Roadhog, you know, lived. Maybe you could have saved him and gotten him out of there, right? You have to at least try, because worst case, you'll get a bunch of old church out of it, right? Imagine the following, right? Let's just imagine for a second, you actually land at this nade, and the enemy team is just wailing on the Roadhog, and you're just holding down left click on him. Okay. You have yeah. your you yeah. have your ult in forty percent. Right. right. I think I would have probably definitely maybe saved him. And exactly. could have had the end on the turn to fight. Right, exactly. Then rotated for a nice you know. sleep, maybe. Exactly, right? So all of those potentialities just kind of yeah. fade out of existence because you give up too early, right? Okay. You were already in a very safe position. You were all the way in the back, right? You would have made it out, right? But at least try to, to you know, kind of keep them alive. Because what you can see is, do you see how, like... At the start, you were trying to go for aggressive nades, but now you need to use heal nades more and more often. Yeah. Whenever you notice that you need to use heal nades a lot, uh, it means that there's not enough pressure coming from you, right? Or okay. coming from your team, 
right? So that should tell you that, okay, we need to regroup here and I need to try to apply more pressure. You know, I need to swing the tempo. I need to land a sleep. I need to land a, a, a big nade, something like that. Now, right here, you need to wait for your tank. There we go. You have an Arissa now. She's coming back, right? Okay, so uh, this right is- Right there, uh, I was gonna- that right there was bad positioning on me because I should have just walked up and nano. Yes. Uh, I think. I don't know why I was sitting there. Uh, I, I think. I, I don't know. Sometimes I just go blank. <laughs> just play play. I, I don't know. I don't know why I was sitting there because I could have easily just walked, like, kind of followed, saw the Arista coming, followed up with the, like, look, got in a better position to, like, follow up with any damage May was doing and possibly mm -hmm. nano. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, Arista. who's going like if you if if you stood like right here, who's going to have the enemy attention? This guy Pro or her? Probably May. Probably May, right? So even yeah. though, do you see how ludicrously aggressive he's playing? He took basically no damage until May died. All of the attention was on the May, right? Mm -hmm. What she's doing is she's creating space. She's pushing up and drawing attention towards her so the people behind her can use that space to push up. But right here, in spite of your May playing so aggressively, you're not pushing in, right? Okay. And then yeah. you're not in a position where you can nano boost her quickly enough to save her. And more importantly, you have your nade, right? Your May is playing very aggressively. Do you see what the enemy Sigma is doing here? He's using his shift. That's the only cooldown the enemy team has, except Suzu, to get rid of her nade, nade, right? Yeah. But oh, what's that? They also used Suzu. Perfect nade right here. Right here? A nade on the Sigma? GG. Game over. Nade on the Sigma, Nano on the Mei. Yeah, that, yes, that would have been perfect. Literally perfect. That opportunity was given to us, but we weren't looking for those cooldowns being used. We weren't pushing up with our May. We weren't looking for that nade. Right? And then after your May dies... Here, that was, yeah, um, that was... Um, <laughs> I should have just... I, like, I should have just... Yeah. 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 <laughs> that, that nade was, was nice right there. You know, and look, here's a... Here's sleep. the uh, yeah, sleep What did I example, even use sleep on? Right? Oh, I missed it. Yeah, that was... Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think you wanted to, like, sleep? I, I think my brain, like, kind of... Yeah? It might have just turned off here, and I was just, like, so confused on why I couldn't, like... Why I wasn't in a good position to nano that May. Yeah. It kind of just threw me off from there I mean, basically, that. everything went wrong there. Your yeah, nano that went was wrong, like, your nade went yeah. wrong, your sleep went wrong, your positioning went wrong. It was... My pathing was horrible. I, yeah, I don't know yeah. what, what what happened there. I think my brain like kind of just turned off. I'm not gonna lie, but I I don't I don't know. That nade here again, a little critical, right? Think, uh -huh. use them opportunistically. Don't just randomly throw them. Use them after cooldowns get used, right? After the Suzu gets used, after the Sigma uses the shift. Now you're in a snowball or, you know, on the receiving end of a snowball. The enemy team is just using a bunch of ultimates to secure teamfight win after teamfight win because you wasted your ultimate earlier. Yes. Right? So in the same yeah. way that when you nano blade, you potentially waste an ultimate. Earlier you wasted an ultimate because it was a 4v5 and now you don't have it which means the enemy team has an ult advantage and they can just snowball you and snowball you and snowball you, okay? Right. Now, we mm -hmm. are unfortunately, so this is a little bit abrupt. I'm very sorry for that. We are unfortunately reaching the end of the time, uh, mainly because we had to go over a lot of theory. But uh, I hope that we still could, you know, cover some things that are uh, interesting for you. Do you have... No, yeah, this, this is good because I, I think I'm going to find out find myself like seeing the opportunities and seeing my mistakes a lot better too mm -hmm. and not like kind of think about how to fix them and stuff like that. So, any yeah, final this, questions? Uh I I pr not at the time. No, not at the time. Awesome. Okay, okay. Then uh, I'll get to writing that summary for uh, you on uh, Metafy. 
if okay. you have any follow-up questions again for 30 days my dms are yours to spam and don't forget you can also include uh, replay codes mm -hmm. right if you have for example a specific nano you want me to look at you can just send me the replay code the timestamp to that team fight and then i'll take a look okay yeah, I'll probably I'll probably like text you a couple questions if I if they so happen to emerge. That's, I know I'll probably have some eventually, but that's not what I'm right here now. for, right? Never hesitate, right? I do this for a living. If as soon as I get home from uni, if I see any questions from you, I'll get back to them as quick as I can. Um, I do have a bit of a special question, right? You don't have to say yes here. This is just optional. But uh, season two is coming out soon uh, of of ranked, right? And with season two, uh, you know people coming back, all of that stuff. Uh, I want to start posting videos on YouTube again, and that includes uh, coaching sessions that I think could be helpful for other people. So I was wondering if you'd be potentially fine with me using this session for YouTube. Obviously, you'd be anonymous. Uh, Yeah, I don't care. Yeah, that's... Awesome. Okay, thank you very, very much. That's really helpful, actually. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Okay. I'm sure people are like, like me all over. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, again, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. I'll send you the link to the summary once it's done. If you need any follow-up coaching, you know where to find me. If you want coaching more long-term, there's the Phoenix Pass uh, that you can also take a look. I told you about that last time. Um, and yeah, I'll let you go. I'll get ready for my next session, and I wish you a good rest of your day. Yeah, thank you. You too. Awesome. Have a good one. See ya. You too. Thanks, man.